the final presentation of the afternoon. It's all yours, John. Hello, Jonathan Brewer, and um, I've been involved with um, ISP networks since 1995 and building access networks since 2004. Um, I love building um, access networks, uh, especially wireless access networks and networks for rural and remote locations. And so it was, um, Ah, oh, they're getting my slides ready. So it was really nice when uh, about 18 months ago, the um, Asian Development Bank uh, asked me to um, work on a paper for them on last mile connectivity. Do we have the slide? Hey, we got a slide here. All right. So this uh, talk is called Last Mile Connectivity, Addressing the Affordability Frontier. It is a companion uh, slide deck to a working paper, uh, ADB's Sustainable Development Working Paper 83. There is a link to that paper on the last slide, uh, along with the disclaimer on the last slide that says, um, these are my ideas and the bank doesn't necessarily endorse or agree with any or all of them. So uh, happy to be here speaking with you today. There we go. So the last mile connects a user's device to telephony and the internet, or it connects a terminal that provides Wi-Fi for user devices. Uh, in developing Asia, the last mile is usually mobile networks. Meaningful connectivity, another topic we're going to talk about that we don't talk about in technical conferences often. It's a framework used to evaluate the quality of internet access. Uh, the concept is promoted by uh, the uh, A4AI, Association for Affordable Internet, and the Broadband Commission for Sustainable, De Sustainable Development, which is part of the UN, UNESCO. Uh, meaningful connectivity goes beyond the traditional uh, definitions of universal service, uh, ooh, universal service, which is uh, having a telecommunication service to everyone and universal access, which is uh, everyone being able to afford to use the service. So affordable broadband is a key tenet of meaningful connectivity. The measure of affordability commonly used in the industry is the cost of some data relative to 2% of GNI per capita. That's the accepted metric. You want more? That's the accepted metric, and both A for AI and the Broadband Commission uh, have used this metric to set targets. Uh, back in 2016, A for AI made their target called one for two, uh, and that is one gigabyte of data per month for 2% of GNI per capita. And the UN, uh, via the Broadband Commission, um, uh, followed that in 2018. Now, both have reevaluated their targets, saying, oh, well, one gig isn't enough. And they've said, oh, A for AI has said by 2026, uh, we should all have five gigabytes a month of data for 2% of GNI per capita. And the Broadband Commission has said, well, I think uh, we, we think that 2030 is a good target for this. But um, it happens that uh, COVID-19 really showed us that one or five gigabytes a month of data is nowhere near enough for most users. Um, this chart here is what it takes in data for a Zoom call or a WebEx or a Google Meet call um, with one person or a few people, six participants or 11 participants. You know, everything went to online meetings, including Apricot and APNIC conferences. Uh, well, that's, um, could the um, technical people stop my slides from auto advancing, please? <laughs> I'll go back there, yeah, if you can just, anyway. Um, so we can use a gigabyte of data an hour uh, and that um, makes uh, one or five gigabyte a month targets uh, not good. So if one or five gigs a month is not enough, how much is? Well, uh, India was already using 10 gigabytes a month of data in like 2019 or 2020 on average. Uh, so this is mobile data consumption. Uh, India, of course, is the top of the averages. Global average there is in black. Um, this data is from Ericsson, uh, from uh, their mobile broadband reports from 2021. They're expecting by 2026 that the Asia Pacific average is going to be 40 gigs a month. So here we have uh, uh, the um, A for AI 2026 target of five gigs. Average is going to be 40, and the Broadband Commission is saying, oh, we should hit that five gigabyte target by 2030. So no, that's 
that's not going to work. Right, we're going to talk about the affordability frontier. The affordability frontier is this place where it's beyond the limits of universal service, it's beyond the limits of universal access, it's beyond government plans for building universal access, uh, it's beyond commercial feasibility. Now, why is it beyond these areas? Either because of poverty or because of geographic isolation or because of both. Uh, so the affordability frontier is an access gap. It is a place where it is just not feasible to provide meaningful connectivity. How do you identify access gaps? Well, I do this for a couple of uh, government uh, uh, departments in New Zealand. I do this for a couple of regions. I use population data from uh, the census, uh, geographical data from uh, LIDAR and satellites, uh, utility information. So uh, GIS data of the um, electrical networks and the fiber networks and uh, the DSLAM cabinet coverage. Um, I build maps of the mobile coverage uh, from tower locations and license data. So how much power they're using, what sort of antennas and frequencies they're using. I make independent coverage maps because they're better than the mobile operator maps. And I would love to have OTT data. We know that a lot of apps on smartphones actually have location information about where people are using them. Um, we've seen this in, in instances like the Strava uh, leak of data where uh, we found military bases because people were recording their runs. Um, I would love to have data um, from OTT application operators to include in this, but I don't. So with gaps identified, um, we should be able to just choose a technology, find a good business model, uh, add some money, add some finance, and we can solve the problems of meaningful connectivity, especially if we're adding finance. Um, but there are a lot of barriers standing in the way of uh, providing meaningful connectivity at the affordability frontier. And we'll talk about those barriers now. First off, geography and population density. We've got um, two evaluations here. Um, one is inhabitants per square kilometer. In, uh, we've got Tanzania here and Indonesia. So uh, we can see that in the rural areas, the population density is far, far, far lower. And in the next um, chart here, we have monthly uh, spend per revenue generating person. So this is, uh, if you happen to be somebody who's gonna buy a mobile subscription, how much money are you spending every month? Well, in uh, urban Indonesia, you may be spending $570 a month. In rural Indonesia, you're spending less than $200 a month. So we have this dual problem of um, far fewer people in rural areas and the people in rural areas have far less money to be spending on their communications. Now, another barrier to building access networks is access to radio spectrum. We've got four types of radio spectrum that are important here. Um, ISM or open spectrum is uh, industrial, scientific, and medical spectrum. We think of it as Wi-Fi spectrum. 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, 900 megahertz. These bands that are free and open for anyone to use from their Wi-Fi terminal to their user device. Um, some people build outdoor access networks with the spectrum, um, but for the most part, we think of it as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We need microwave or fixed um, spectrum to backhaul cell sites. Um, most cell sites in this world are still backhauled with microwave. They are not even close to being backhauled by fiber yet. Um, fiber is a Western world thing when it comes to cell towers. Um, satellite spectrum. Satellite spectrum is generally used to provide service to a terminal. Um, it's used to provide tower backhaul. It's used to provide city or island backhaul. One day soon, it will be uh, used to provide backhaul directly to people's mobile devices. Um, that day isn't yet, but that day is probably sometime this year. So um, uh, we should look forward to the latest uh, Qualcomm Android devices and Apple devices having some direct uh, from satellite to device connectivity soon. So in terms of radio spectrum in um, Asian Development Bank's member countries, which mostly overlap with uh, APNIC, um, we have the um, Commonwealth of Independent States in ADB's developing member countries, uh, and they are in RIPE, I believe. They're, they're all in RIPE, aren't they, Philip? Sorry. Yeah, CIS are all right. Anyway, um, spectrum in ADB countries is generally much under allocated. 
uh, in uh, 700 megahertz, 2.3 gigahertz, 2,500 megahertz. Um, most of the spectrum is not allocated. Regulators could increase those allocations and everybody's mobile phone can use these bands. So it would be of benefit to everyone. Access to energy. So cellular towers usually require reliable grid power. Cellular towers take kilowatts of electricity. Five kilowatts is kind of a, a small tower. Um, hard to do that on solar. Uh, if you do have grid power in a remote location, uh, it tends to be less reliable than in an urban location. Uh, when it breaks, it takes longer to get it fixed. We're seeing this all over New Zealand um, with the result of the cyclone from two weeks ago. Our most remote communities uh, still have neighborhoods without power. Our most remote cell sites still are without power uh, because it takes longer to repair. So alternative energy solutions, they can be large and costly. Here we have the amount of uh, solar panels required to power one tower, one set of antennas here, one microwave backhaul link. And uh, I'm told by a neighbor of this tower that the diesel generator here runs pretty much all the time and there are trucks coming to refill the fuel every month. So even this many solar panels is not enough to run this cell tower. So some other barriers here, uh, access to land towers and buildings um, throughout this region and throughout the world, the incumbent is usually some descendant of a state owned enterprise, such as the post office uh, or uh, the phone company, you know, the, the, the dominant carriers they used to be the government, so they have access to the best buildings, the best hilltops, the best towers, the best access routes. Um, sometimes they don't want to share that access. Frequently, they don't want to share that access. Safety and security of people and property. Um, again, using New Zealand as an example, um, the biggest problem we're having in keeping remote communications up since the cyclone is generator theft. There have been a large number of generator thefts and a large amount of resources being ex expended now to keep people from stealing the generators. Um, when it comes to people, well, cellular technicians drive around in trucks with trucks full of tools uh, and they are a target for theft. Batteries in cell sites are a target for theft. Solar panels are a target for theft. As you get into more remote areas, you have no police presence. You have no way of uh, uh, protecting yourself against this theft, so it just makes it much harder. Another barrier out there is operator licensing. Um, in most uh, markets in uh, the APNIC community, um, governments restrict the building of infrastructure to only a few companies. Most countries here, there are only three or four or five operators who are actually allowed to build their own fiber optic cables uh, and cellular towers. Uh, and the rest of them who do go and build their own fiber um, aren't actually doing it with legal permission. Finally, access to finance. Um, as we saw in the slide comparing Indonesia and Tanzania, um, your customers in a rural area are poor. There are far fewer of them. Um, you don't have the money to, uh, to make a good return on those customers, so your finance is going to be very difficult. Your lenders are going to look at the business proposition of building a new cellular tower in a remote area, and they're going to say, don't do that. That's not good for your business. Right. With those barriers taken away, let's talk about technologies, which is more um, this sort of conference. Um, fiber and wireless technologies are the ones that are important for um, our community and for Asian development banks, uh, developing member countries. Um, GPON, Gigabit Passive Optical Network. GPON is a great technology, both for fixed access and for mobile backhaul, for tower backhaul. Um, we're just starting to see a bit of GPON in uh, the four and eight gigabit per second variants used for mobile tower backhaul in New Zealand. Um, there are also wireless technologies that can uh, be used to address uh, broadband at the affordability frontier, like mobile broadband, but some of these wireless technologies are like mobile broadband and they provide voice, SMS, and data. Some of them just provide data. So the first one here, uh, GPON, um, it's called passive because these optical networks don't need any power between the head ends. 
uh, and the subscriber units. Now the head ends can be in a building, they can be in a cabinet on the side of the road, or like in this photo below, they can be on a pole. That's how big it is. Uh, and these micro OLTs here can support up to 2000 subscribers. Uh, they can reach up to 40 kilometers in a star topology. Um, most people don't build networks that are that wide, but in very sparse places, um, there's no reason that you wouldn't. Fiber is very cheap. So these small pole mounted network cabinets can provide service to 2000 subscribers. If you're doing this, you're having every 128 users share a 2.4 gigabit per second access medium in the downlink, 1.2 gigabit per second in the uplink. One of the things you can do with mobile networks that um, we see very few places in the world is a concept called RAN sharing or radio access network sharing. Why do we need RAN sharing? Um, GSMA says that you need 3,000 daily users on a tower uh, in a 25 square kilometer uh, um, radius uh, area, I should say, in order to have a profitable service. That's a lot of users in a remote location. Now, tower sharing, which is a big deal here in the Philippines, um, with uh, the Philippine government enabling um, tower codes to, to come in and, and build towers all over the place and lease them to multiple operators, Tower sharing helps. Wholesale roaming agreements help where uh, say I'm on carrier A, um, carrier B provides wholesale roaming in some areas for carrier A. Um, these aren't the most effective ways of um, providing access in remote areas. RAN sharing is absolutely the most efficient. In a case of RAN sharing, uh, like in this photo below, we've got one set of antennas, we've got one set of mobile equipment, we've got one set of radio spectrum, We've got three carriers all offering their own service over this system. You as a consumer will not know that you're on a RAN sharing tower. It's going to look like you have signal from your carrier. You don't know that you're roaming uh, and uh, the service just works. The control happens in the core of each individual mobile network operator. Um, so this is uh, this is an example of a Moran. In the paper, I discuss a couple of different RAN sharing technologies. Now, another thing that happens with um, LTE at the affordability frontier are small cells. These are um, small devices meant for small coverage areas, uh, as in one kilometer dist uh, radius. They take low power. I said before, a cell tower generally takes five kilowatts. You can get small cells that run at 200 watts per sector. Um, you can get them at 100 watts per sector. 200 watts is about normal for a small cell. Um, and um, the trade-off here is that they don't support 3,000 users. They support 128 or they support 64 or 32. They, they support far fewer users, uh, but they're good for low density areas in remote locations. Another LTE technology at the affordability frontier is LTE fixed wireless. Um, this can be from a small cell. It can be from a carrier macro cell network. The idea is that you put a terminal on a rooftop. The terminal has a built-in antenna. The antenna gets you a longer path. You have a cable. It comes to an indoor terminal. The indoor terminal has Wi-Fi. So when you're using LTE fixed wireless access, you are using Wi-Fi on uh, your consumer devices inside connected to a terminal. 30Ks is a typical reach for 4G, but um, 200 is possible and actually done by Telstra in Australia. Um, they were uh, the first to work on this, I think, with Ericsson. Uh, and some of their remote towers are set up for um, ultra long distance communications because if you live where Rhett lives in the middle of nowhere, um, you, uh, you're 40 kilometers drive from the nearest gas station and there's nobody else out there with you. So you really need that long distance. Community LTE. Community LTE takes the idea of small cells, which still provide voice and SMS service um, and are still part of a mobile network. Community LTE gets rid of that. They get rid of um, the, um, the mobile network core, the idea of cell handovers, the idea of roaming, the idea of doing voice. You have a, a, a gateway to the internet inside of your small cell. So you have this device, it's like an LTE Wi-Fi hotspot. You um, put it up, um, you issue SIM cards, uh, you have it connected straight to the internet and um, 
you basically have cellular hotspots. Now, this is um, something that's going on quite a bit in the U.S. with um, one of their open spectrum bands called CBRS. Um, we are starting to see it here. This example here is in Indonesia. Um, there, there is community LTE equipment out there in the sort of $2,000 range. So um, it's something that is an up and coming technology. So I um, talked about open spectrum um, a couple of minutes ago. Most people use open spectrum daily. Um, it's used for Wi-Fi. It can be used for fixed wireless. Um, Wi-Fi itself, and I make this point, um, Wi-Fi is a last inch technology. It works well when you're close by. 10 meters, 50 meters, you get to 100 meters and Wi-Fi actually stops working well. I mean, even in this room, I, I heard some people complaining that Wi-Fi wasn't working so well. Open spectrum fixed wireless takes, generally takes a Wi-Fi chipset, changes the software, changes the protocols, allows you to use Wi-Fi chipsets and Wi-Fi spectrum outdoors in a point-to-point -point or a point-to-multi-point configuration where you have terminals just like you have LTE fixed wireless. You've got a little tower, you've got a little terminal on a rooftop, you get your distances of tens of kilometers. Here are a couple of examples of this from some of my customers. The one on the left is a microsite. It's providing service to four or five households uh, in a remote valley in uh, Taranaki in New Zealand. And it has an, a fixed wireless, uh, open spectrum fixed wireless backhaul, taking it back to a tower and then to another tower and then to another tower and eventually to fiber optic. On the right hand side, uh, we've got a, a more serious um, tower on a um, hill called Kalrenike in uh, uh, Gisborne, uh, Nelson area. Uh, and uh, this provides service to a few tens of households and actually has around 500 megabits per second, exactly 500 megabits per second of backhaul. You think, wow, how do you do 500 megabits per second of backhaul on little dishes like this? Well, all last mile solutions need backhaul. Microwave, as I said before, is the most common mobile tower backhaul worldwide, far more common than fiber still. Open spectrum fixed wireless, like we saw on the left here, um, it's good. It's good, especially where you're in a remote area. There are no other users around. You're the only one using the spectrum. There's no interference potential. Um, microwave is uh, light with licensed spectrum is a much better option because in 30 or 50 watts, you can get 500 or uh, a gigabit uh, worth of microwave backhaul um, with a very low amount of power. So 30 or 50 watts to power your microwave unit and uh, you get 500 megs or a gig. GPON can be a great option where you've got cable, where you can hang cables. Um, fiber for GPON tails is like 20 cents a meter now. It's $200 a kilometer. That's not a lot of money. That's, that's less than microwave units if you're doing, you know, 20, 30 kilometer GPON drop. And finally, LEO satellite networks. LEO satellites like Starlink, which uh, just launched in um, the Philippines last week. Yes, it can be used to uh, backhaul wireless towers, like in this photo on the left from my friend Liam. This is a Starlink dishy terminal that he's got feeding a, uh, a little Wi-Fi repeater for, uh, or this is actually is a Wi-Fi repeater for, for local coverage on a farm. Um, in the recovery to the cyclone in New Zealand, there were tens of Starlink units that were connected to mobile phone towers and connected to wireless ISP sites. Uh, and brought plugged into generators connected at um, community centers to get people access to the internet. Can be very good, it can be very fast. Uh, on the right, we've got more traditional microwave backhaul. Um, I did the license engineering for all of these uh, links on the Gizmer Net Tower. And some of these are going 50 or 60 kilometers from this tower location. They're still only using 30 or 50 watts per dish. Um, they're all getting at least 500 megabits per second. So um, it is a very good option, especially if you have a structure you can put big dishes on. The um, Starlink terminal, by the way, takes more than 100 watts, uh, up to 150 watts in cold climates where it needs to use its heater. So um, Starlink is not as power efficient as microwave. Starlink is also only giving you around 200 megabits down and 10 or 15 megabits up um, for your 100 watts, whereas these microwave links are giving you 
500 megs or a gig for your 30 or 50 watts. So the microwave is definitely much more power efficient for the amount of capacity you get. So this is just an excerpt from the paper. I don't expect anybody to really look at this. Um, the point is that there are a lot of trade-offs when it comes to um, building access networks. The lowest cost, lowest power, and highest throughput access networks here do not support mobility. And yet, what is it that everybody wants? They all want their cell phones to work everywhere. So you can build really good, really high capacity, really inexpensive connectivity in rural and remote areas, but in general, it's not gonna be a traditional mobile network. So how do we get broadband out there? How do we get it out to the affordability frontier? Well, there are some finance strategies and one of those is by creating service obligations. This is where a regulator may say to an operator, hey, if you want some fancy 5G spectrum, we want you to build a whole bunch of remote towers. We want you to cross subsidize these remote towers with income from your urban networks. Uh, France and Brazil are two great examples of this happening with uh, very recent auctions. Now, a smart subsidy is a one-time subsidy usually provided, usually provided to a carrier um, or an infrastructure provider to help service get established in a remote location, in a location where it's not economic to build. Um, smart subsidies expect that once this infrastructure is built, it will be financially sustainable, um, that it will not need ongoing subsidies to continue operating. And oftentimes a, a government finance provider will make a contract with the recipient of the finance and say, well, you need to have this infrastructure running here for 10 years uh, in order to get the money. I think that when governments um, provide smart subsidies for um, unaffordable um, places that they should be financing only open access infrastructure. Um, for example, towers built by tower co's, operated by tower co's, and towers that are only available on a wholesale basis and not owned by a single operator and can't be excluded. Um, same with fiber optic cables. I, I don't think any government should subsidize a fiber optic cable that goes to a remote province uh, and then give that cable to a single operator. I think any cable like that should be available for everyone. Uh, sometimes governments decide to provide a subsidy for a managed service. A good example would be um, Vanuatu uh, provided connectivity to a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, nursing um, stations, medicine dispensaries um, on different islands, satellite backhaul. And they said, what, along with this, you need to have Wi-Fi access points for the local community to access the internet. So the provider put all of these satellite links in and uh, put Wi-Fi public Wi-Fi access points in along with this. Um, the problem you have with these uh, limited subsidies is that once the contract for service ends, um, the local access goes away too, or can. Now, final one, sending party pays. I talk about this more in the paper. I know this is, is um, an offensive topic to some people in the internet community. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody gets up at the microphone and, and makes a comment, even after the no comments earlier today. But um, toll-free calls and free posts are uh, analog examples of sending party pays. It means that um, you as the sender of information are paying for it. Um, I know nobody wants to hear this. In, in New Zealand, um, a couple of government departments have actually paid the mobile carriers to make information free and, and not charging data on your mobile plan. So our Ministry of Social Development and our Ministry of Health um, have made it so that you can have a cell phone subscription with zero credit, a prepaid cell phone, uh, no data left. You can still access their websites. Uh, and that's because they're paying the carriers to carry their data. I think this is a great idea for government data. I think it's a great idea for educational data. I think it's a terrible idea if corporations are allowed to start doing this. But uh, but it can be a very effective uh, thing for promoting access in uh, places where people really don't have the money to, to spend on access. Now, some policies. Uh, this, is, this is the last of the talk here. <laughs> Um, broadband plans I'll just mention because they're an important way for countries to um, 
kind of define their needs and organize a way of uh, meeting the needs of their people. And the people should be the focus in these plans. Public Wi-Fi is very, very popular in this region. Um, the Philippines has People Connect. Um, India has PM Wani. Uh, there have been other projects throughout the region uh, done with Facebook Wi-Fi, Express Wi-Fi, and Google Station um, that have brought public Wi-Fi out. Public Wi-Fi is great, but public Wi-Fi does not generally help women and people with disabilities. It does not generally help people who don't have their own personal devices. In order to have equitable access to the internet, it needs to be available in the home where people can use it in private. Now, um, here we go on, on my rants uh, after building infrastructure here in the Philippines and um, helping with projects in Indonesia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, and of course, in, in New Zealand and Australia, um, national regulations should establish norms for telco infrastructure. In the Philippines, it can take tens of permits to build a mobile tower. Uh, and, um, and that just doesn't work. In New Zealand, you don't need a permit. If your mobile tower is of a certain size in a certain location, you don't actually need a permit to build it because the government passed a law that says these are the national regulations. This is what you're allowed to do without asking special permission. Um, this is a great idea that I would love to see copied throughout the region. Now, if you are going to have permits, um, there is the idea that a permit should be deemed approved if you don't act on it. So um, sometimes you might apply to a government agency for a permit, and then they might not do anything. They might just sit on it. It might sit there for weeks or months, and you can call them and come back in person, and they're just not doing anything. Permits should be applied after 30 days, uh, should be approved automatically after 30 days uh, if they're not acted on. This is a regulation that exists in some countries in this world, so it would not be a unique uh, or new thing. I think that co-deployment should be uh, enabled and promoted. Co-deployment is allowing fiber optic cables to be built along new roadways, along bridges, along new power lines, uh, and um, it should be promoted on a cost-sharing basis uh, because sometimes we see utility operators and governments say, right, you're going to gain a great value by bringing your fiber out to this remote area. We want you to pay a commercial return for putting your fiber there. We want a cut of the revenue. This, this has happened in New Zealand too. Uh, it doesn't anymore. Um, but um, it should be uh, charged on a cost-sharing basis uh, and, and in a non-discriminatory basis. Um, finally, radio spectrum management. Radio is my, uh, my specialty here. Um, radio spectrum is important. Um, spectrum should be made available for services that benefit society. Um, in general, this is mobile spectrum open spectrum for Wi-Fi and fixed wireless and satellite spectrum. Um, it should be priced to balance the benefits to the society and revenue, because sometimes countries say, oh, we can get a billion dollars by auctioning this radio spectrum. And then they take the money and then they spend the money on programs that have nothing to do with telecommunications. And then they complain that it's expensive for people to buy mobile service. And that's because every dollar a carrier spends on radio spectrum is money they're not spending on infrastructure. So that's my rant there. Um, finally, uh, flexible licensing regimes. I mentioned before that most countries do not allow carriers to build their own infrastructure. Um, they have this idea of uh, facilities-based operators. They have this idea here in the Philippines of a legislative franchise for building uh, infrastructure. Um, this is a terrible idea because these regulations are meant for large companies. They're meant for large national access providers, and they uh, they are a barrier to community networks. They're a barrier to small ISPs, um, local and regional providers that need to be able to build infrastructure to serve small communities. Um, so all countries in this region should be making new legislation enabling small fiber networks and small wireless networks to be built and say, well, maybe once you have a thousand subscribers, then there's a different set of rules that applies to you. But if you're a community network providing 50 or 100 households, then no, you shouldn't have these um, onerous requirements.
Um, I think that uh, market restrictions for international operators should be eased, especially where these international operators are providing wholesale uh, services, say they're providing open access fiber, open access towers. Um, they, they shouldn't be required to um, engage a local partner and, and provide a revenue share to a local partner who may not be doing anything. Uh, and finally, I think that global satellite companies um, should be able to participate in um, all markets on a fair and open basis, um, especially because emerging low Earth orbit networks like Starlink and OneWeb and uh, O3B mPower um, are going to provide global coverage good for access and backhaul. Um, allowing them to sell wholesale capacity without requiring them to set up their own business in every single country. Um, if they only sell wholesale capacity, they're going to be providing a benefit to the market and the people of the country. Um, next slide, please. Ah, there we go. Excellent. So that's it. Um, again, um, same disclaimer as at the beginning. Um, these are my views. They don't necessarily reflect the views and policies of the ADB or its Board of Governors. However, please scan the QR code, download the paper. Paper's around 70 pages. You don't have to read all of it. It's, uh, um, it was a lot of fun working on it, um, a lot of fun working with the people who helped me on this. Uh, I don't know if Raj Singh is in the audience. Um, he was one of the reviewers. Um, Grace Santos, who's been out in the hallway today, is another one of the reviewers. My great friend Steve Song um, from Mozilla Foundation was another reviewer. Uh, we all had a great time uh, doing this paper, and we hope it's useful to you. Thank you. Any questions for John? What have we done to you this afternoon? <laughs> We normally get so many questions for our APOP speakers, and we have had not a single one for Garta, or Mark, or, or John. Nothing? No? Oh, well. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful talk. Appreciate it. Oh, I got a pen. You got a pen. Right. Um, so that brings us to the end of um, today's session. Um, we had three great talks. Um, we reckon these were the best that were offered for the program. So we wanted to share them with you all. Um, tomorrow morning, we start again, 9.30, with the second APOP session. Uh, Maz will be chairing that. Um, so we welcome you back then. So the opening social tonight uh, starts at 7 p.m. It's in the Conrad Hotel. Buses will start leaving at 6.30. Now, to collect the bus or get to the bus, please come to the registration desk and the PHNOG team will guide you where you have to go to catch the bus. The buses will be out in the car park out at the front. They can't come up to the front door. So the PHNOG team will guide you where to collect your bus. So the first bus leaves at 6.30. Um, Prizes are apparently going to be awarded for the best national dress. Um, so folks who want to dress up in local costume or the Filipino costume um, or go as is, it's up to you. Um, prizes are going to be awarded. It's, I don't know, you're going to learn a lot about PHNOG when you're here this week. And um, we don't know what surprises there will be. Um, I'm looking at Achi because I don't know what he's planning. But anyway, I hope you enjoy the social event this evening. It's sponsored by PH Colo. We really, really appreciate that sponsorship and I'm looking forward to a great evening. Enjoy the evening and we will see you back here tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much.